In the February 2023 issue of SFX magazine, Star Trek Picard showrunner Terry Metalis was interviewed about the third and final season of the show, which he had called game-changing. Asked to clarify this tantalizing statement, he noted that there is definitely a major event in the Star Trek universe. But not in a way that undoes it, but it will feel like an event in Star Trek history. For instance, in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, you know what I mean? That would be a moment in Star Trek history that everyone would remember, and that's certainly true here. The final cruise of the original crew began with an explosion so large it redefined historic boundaries and relations with formerly implacable foes. In that sense, for what is to be the final outing for Star Trek Picard with another crew, we could prognosticate until the cows come home about potential turning points. In any case, I guess we'll find out soon. Along with the Praxis ignition point of Star Trek VI, Metallus' comments got us thinking about other such pivotal moments in the franchise's history. What was the galactic state of play before, and how did things change afterwards? There is certainly no shortage of such momentous events. And so, with that in mind, I'm Ellie with Trek Culture, here with 10 events that changed Star Trek forever. Number 10. Romulans Revealed On screen, we first saw the Romulans in the original series episode Balance of Terror. Created by writer Paul Schneider, the species already had a mythic status for the characters. No one from Starfleet had heard a whisper from the enigmatic enemy since the Earth-Romulan War more than a century prior, and after which the Romulan neutral zone was established. In point of fact, and this despite some four years of conflict in the 22nd century, no one had even seen the face of a Romulan and lived to tell the tale. Quite a shock for Spock then, when the view screen flickered on and the Romulan commander looked an awful lot like him. Not only did this auricular revelation radically alter interstellar politics for the next 150 odd years, and and even well into the 32nd century, we also found out fairly recently just how crucial Kirk's presence on the Enterprise was when meeting that bird of prey in 2266. In an alternate timeline where Captain Christopher Pike had dodged his destiny and was in command of the Enterprise instead, his less guns ablaze in approach had end of the world type consequences a war with the Romulans that killed millions. Also, with Spock horrifically injured in that timeline, any hopes for reunification and lasting peace were scuppered indefinitely. Not even alternate future Pike's monster maroons could make up for that. Number 9. The Treaty of Algeron It's either the biggest mistake the Federation ever made if you're Team Pressman, or the finest bit of diplomacy in decades if you're Team Picard. If your team's stuck in the middle Riker though, just head down to the holodeck and play the role of a certain historical chef slash poor man's ship's counsellor, you'll be spilling the beans, perhaps literally, in no time. A peace agreement signed in 2311, the Treaty of Algeron redefined Federation relations with the Romulan Star Empire. It further codified the terms and deliminations of the Romulan neutral zone, making any flagrant trespass by either party an act of war. Furthermore, it forbade the Federation from developing or using cloaking technology. The whole Pegasus debacle slash cover-up stemmed from Admiral Pressman and others at Starfleet's refusal to accept this latter part of the deal, considering Starfleet's lack of cloaking technology a major tactical weakness. Treaty ratified, the Romulans practically disappeared, as had been the case before the encounter with Kirk's Enterprise in the 23rd century. They only returned in an official manner to galactic affairs in 2364 in the Next Generation episode aptly called The Neutral Zone. There had been the odd foray before that, such as that one time where a certain alternate lieutenant was present, but now they were really back to medal once more. The main impetus for the signing of the treaty came from what is known as the Tomed Incident. Very little information is given in canon about this confrontation between the Romulans and the Federation, other than the fact that it cost thousands of lives. Beta canon does go into more detail, and you can find out more about that in our video 10 Biggest Secrets Revealed in Star Trek Novels. Before Tomed and Algeron, and after Balance of Terror, the Federation and the Romulans had engaged each other in a number of skirmishes, including Kirk's incognito cloak-stealing mission, with a brief period of peace in the co-parenting of the backwater planet Nimbus III, starting in 2267. The Romulans were also up to their ears in the plot to prevent peace between the Klingons and the Federation, which included the assassination of the Klingon Chancellor Gorkon after that Klingon moon memorably went boom. Number 8. The Destruction of Praxis Oh, the Klingons. Some of us love them, some of us loathe them more than a moribund tribble after a meal of poisoned Quadra Triticale. Klingon Earth relations were certainly tempestuous from the outset when Archer and the crew of the NX-01 had the first run-ins with the species. 
Things hadn't gone any better about a hundred years later when tensions erupted into open warfare at the Binary Stars and nearly led to defeat for the Federation but for some last-minute heroics from Michael Burnham. During Kirk's five-year mission in command of the Enterprise, major conflict with the Klingons once again reared its much smoother head. By 2267, war seemed almost inevitable until the godlike Organians stepped in to prevent it. Despite the involvement of the Organians, however, the Federation's relationship with the Klingons remained tenuous at best, and the Enterprise was involved in multiple altercations with the Warriors in the years that followed. The Klingons were also responsible for the death of Kirk's son, David Marcus. It wasn't until some dodgy mining practices caused an explosion that obliterated the Klingon moon of Praxis, risking total environmental collapse on Kronos, that things changed forever. War had become too expensive for the Empire, and so the Klingons sat down at the negotiating table instead. After a lot of conspiring on both sides and a good deal of Shakespeare, the Kitama Accords were signed in 2293, a step towards a lasting peace with the Federation. They remained continuously in force until Chancellor Gowron, not without a tiny bit of nudging from a changeling infiltrator, reneged on them temporarily in 2372. It is also worth noting that that previously mentioned alternate future lieutenant played a crucial role in solidifying relations between the Klingons and the Federation after Kitama aboard the Enterprise see at the Battle of Narendra III in 2344. Number 7. The Supernova of 2387 The Federation and the Romulan Star Empire were hardly BFFs before it was discovered that the Romulan Sun was working on its last hurrah. Things had become moderately more cordial, however, after Shinzon's ultimately failed coup d'etat in 2379, as even the Romulans drew the line at genocide. Preliminary peace talks were due to begin with the Romulans after the Praetor's defeat. The Romulans also helped out during the Dominion War, although only after some underhanded coaxing, to put it mildly. If they'd ever found out about Sisko and Garrick's murderous scheming, a star wouldn't have been the only thing about to explode. As we found out from Admiral Jellico in the Star Trek Prodigy episode Masquerade, peace talks with the Romulans were ongoing and showing promise in 2384, although the neutral zone was still firmly in place, preventing the Dauntless from following following the protostar. Una McCormack's prequel novel to Star Trek Picard Season 1, Star Trek Picard The Last Best Hope, reveals that the Federation became aware of the holy bleeping bleep fat that the Romulan sun was nearing its end as early as 2381, and a vast relocation effort was launched almost immediately as a result. That plan was summarily ended with the synth attack on the Utopia Planitia shipyards that wiped out the evacuation fleet in 2385. In a move akin to using a laser scalpel to slice your toast, the synth attack was in fact, as everyone found out years later, orchestrated by a group of Romulans themselves, the ultra-secretive and ultra-dogmatic Jat Vash, led by undercover operative Commodore slash General O, who had infiltrated Starfleet security, as the admonition had convinced them all since were evil. Their actions would ultimately cost millions upon millions of their compatriots' lives, as the Federation abandoned the planned evacuation of Romulus. The Federation also banned synthetic lifeforms after the attack, leading inexorably to the death of Thaddeus Troy Riker. The ban remained until 2399. In one last ditch attempt, in 2387, Ambassador Spock tried to use red matter, whatever that is, to prevent the Romulan star from going supernova, but failed to do so in time. When Spock's jellyfish was then attacked by the vengeful Nero, both were sent back to the past, creating an entirely new timeline in which Vulcan paid the price for what was essentially O's doing. With Romulus destroyed, the Star Empire became the Romulan Free State, although most surviving Romulans were scattered across the galaxy. The neutral zone was assigned to the history books, and groups such as the Fenris Rangers, including Member 7 of 9, now sought to protect the area they felt the Federation had washed its hands of. Number 6. Control a dark prophecy of a future in which smart speakers have finally had enough of setting timers for us. Control was an artificial intelligence based at the headquarters of Section 31 and used by Starfleet more widely for threat assessment in the mid-23rd century. After the war with the Klingon, certain hardliners at Starfleet Command wanted all decision-making to be transferred to Control. Powered by nefarious AI programming from the 28th century, Control was also becoming self-aware and only needed the sphere data from the Discovery to fully achieve this goal. In the future, as witnessed by Gabriel Burnham, Control had absorbed the sphere data and gone on to wipe out all life in the galaxy by the 32nd century. With no other way to ensure that the sphere data would not fall into the hands of Control, it was decided that the Discovery would have to remove itself from the equation and travel to the future, not before an epic battle with the assistance of the the Klingons and the Kelpians. 
All remaining traces of control in the 23rd century were then eradicated, and Starfleet was sold the lie that the Discovery had been destroyed. Furthermore, anyone with knowledge of the ship, its crew, or its spore drive were forbidden to ever discuss it under penalty of treason. A handy workaround for the writers, but one heck of a kick in the teeth for Voyager. Not only did these events have a major impact on the 23rd century, notably for the period's FTL technology and Spock's loss and never mentioning of a sister, it also changed the 32nd century forever as the Discovery's spore drive became vital to the Federation in that time. Number 5. The Burn the answer to the question only René Picard had been asking. What if all active warp cores suddenly exploded because dilithium stopped doing its job? The Burn was the great mystery plot arc of Star Trek Discovery Season 3. To say it had a disappointing denouement would be the biggest understatement since Captain Janeway said, I think I'm going to start doing something a little different with my hair. But we've moved on from the Kelpian catastrophe now. Pre-Burn, which was mid-31st century, and pre-arrival of the Discovery, which got to the future in the 32nd century, dilithium was already a scarce commodity, and technological alternatives to the problem were the object of intensive but ultimately fruitless and even controversial research. One such solution, SB-19, proved so divisive that Navarre, formerly known as Vulcan, feeling they were responsible for the burn because of SB-19, seceded from the Federation. Ultimately, the cause of the burn was the botched hunt for dilithium itself and the angry Kelpian. Beyond Navarre, the after-effects of the simultaneous explosion of the vast majority of Federation starships were pretty much what you'd expect them to be. Almost no more Federation, significantly diminished with only 38 worlds of the prior 350 remaining in the organization. Even Earth left, and Starfleet and the Federation, barely able to run their remaining ships, became more and more isolated from the rest of the galaxy as a new criminal coalition, the Emerald Chain, rose to power in the fight for resources. But have no fear, Disco's here. Mystery solved, case closed, happier Federation families, eventually. Number 4. United The Federation had to start somewhere, right? That kind of union of planets doesn't just spring up overnight. We saw some of these humble but crucial beginnings in a three-episode arc of Star Trek Enterprises Season 4, the second episode of which is knowingly entitled United. In laying the groundwork for the signing of the Federation Charter in 2161, the events of these episodes arguably had more of an impact on Star Trek than any other. In the first part, Babel 1, much like in the title of that original series episode, Enterprise is journeying to the titular planet where Earth is due to mediate talks between the Andorians and the Tellarites to avoid a possible war. The Romulans have other ideas, however, and begin using a fancy new drone ship equipped with holographic projectors to sow discord in the region by attacking in the guise of other vessels. Nonetheless, after a lot of convincing and a Yushan ritual that leaves Commander Shran a little lopsided, the Andorians, Tellarites, and the Vulcans join forces with Enterprise to create a sensor net capable of detecting the Romulan drone ship. The plan works, and the Andorians and Tellarites sit down to form a more sustainable alliance, a first between the two species. About a year later, in 2155, talks began on Earth with the Vulcans, Andorians, Rigelians, Denobulans, Coridonites, and Tellarites to establish a coalition of planets, which then gave rise to the United Federation of Planets. And to think they never would have gotten away with it if it weren't for those meddling Romulans. Number 3. Borg Cube When it comes to fighting the Borg, you might just need to imitate the greats, or doing an Ensign Hickman, as it is also known, if you don't want to end up with a cortical node. Before Janeway, fewer had had as much experience with the cybernetically enhanced creatures as Captain Picard and his crew. In the Next Generation episode Q Who, Mr. Next of Kin to Chaos transported the Enterprise D 7,000 light years across the galaxy to face an enemy the likes of which Starfleet and the Federation had never seen. The pitiful adversaries, as Q put it, of the Romulans and the Klingons paled in comparison to the new threat that awaited them in the shape of a cube. Whilst there had been murmurings of their existence in the Federation prior to this incident, and indeed you can argue that human knowledge of them goes all the way back to First Contact in 2063 and the NX-01 skirmish in 2153, this was the first time a Starfleet vessel had met the Borg Collective proper, and made it out unassimilated. The Hansons, with the little information they had at the time, presumably a good deal of it from the Elorian survivors, set off to search for the Borg in 2347. They, however, followed a Borg cube into the Delta Quadrant and were assimilated in 2350, some 14 to 15 years before the destruction of various outposts along the Neutral Zone and the Enterprise D's eventual encounter. Arguably, no single adversary has had more of an impact on Star Trek than the Borg. As Captain Janeway once again put it, from the moment Q flung the Enterprise into the path of that first cube to the massacre of Wolf 359, with an assimilated Picard slash Locutus leading the attack. 
After that devastating battle, Starfleet developed its first ever warship, the Defiant, to fight them. The crew of the Enterprise D hesitated over Hugh and hindered Law, and Voyager's history with the Collective could fill an entire video in and of itself ending in that crippling Neuralytic knockout. The Borg were also a predominant feature of Star Trek Picard seasons 1 and 2, and who knows what the ramifications of the Jurati slash Borgati collective side project and the mahusive transwarp conduit will be. We might need an entire spin-off series to find out. Let's also just pause here to honour the wonderful Annie Wershing, who sadly passed away in January 2023. We will remember her for her delightfully dastardly performance as the Borg Queen in Picard and as Liana in Star Trek Enterprise. Prize's Season 1 episode, Oasis. Number 2. Project Khan Long before the Earth was united in a peaceful coalition and before humans developed warp drive, things were looking grim. Humanity had been experimenting with enhancing the species through genetic manipulation, and this had led to a band of so-called superior despots trying to run the show. In Star Trek's history of the early 1990s, one such augment, or Superman as he's referred to in the original series episode Space Seed, Khan Noonien Singh, ruled over more than a quarter of Earth. The battle to defeat the augments, known as the Eugenics Wars, cost at least 30 million lives and led to a blanket ban on genetic engineering, the ramifications of which were still being felt centuries later. Any human or alien who had been the subject of genetic manipulation was barred from serving in Starfleet. Having hidden the fact that she was an Illyrian who used genetic engineering, the last we saw of Una No. 1 Chin Riley in Star Trek Strange New Worlds was her arrest. Julian Bashir, who had similarly covered up his genetically engineered status to get into Starfleet, was eventually given special dispensation to remain. It was only in 2384, after some excellent testimony from Admiral Janeway, that Starfleet knowingly allowed a genetically engineered person, Dahl, to at least begin the process of entering the Academy by serving as a warrant officer in training under Janeway's command. Before trying their hand at cybernetics, the Sung family also produced a couple of crackpot geneticists. In the early 21st century, Adam Sung tried to enhance humanity through its genes and, as part of his efforts, creates a series of failed but one human clones. His research was destroyed by the end of the Star Trek Picard Season 2 episode Farewell, but he was seen fishing out a paper report entitled Project Khan, dated 1996. His descendant, Arik Soong, continued the madness in the 22nd century, with a few of the augment embryos that had been preserved from the eugenics wars. When the Klingons saw the potential in this, it resulted in a virus that caused the smooth head phenomenon. Of course, Khan himself would be found aboard the SS Botany Bay by the Enterprise in 2267. Gone again, then back again in full-on revenge mode, he would be permanently gone again in the movie that needs no citation. Number 1. A Camping Trip in the Gamma Quadrant a father-son camping trip thousands of light years across the galaxy on a newly charted planet so that Jake can do his dream science project. What could possibly go wrong? Oh, and Nog needs to come along too so he can stay in school, and Quark has his eyes on monetizing the station's monitors so we'll be crashing the party. Evidently, once the campfire clownery is out of the way, Commander Sisko and Quark, along with Avorta desperate to secure that EGOT, are captured by a mysterious new species, the Jem'Hadar. It is important to note that the Season 2 finale of Star Trek Deep Space Nine we're talking about, the Jem Hadar, was the first time members of the Dominion were seen on screen. The dictatorial, warmongering foe had been mentioned by name in previous episodes of Deep Space Nine Season 2 for the first time in Rules of Acquisition and were introduced as a sort of anti-federation, as writer-producer Robert Hewitt Wolf put it in the Deep Space Nine Season 3 DVD special features. The present episode then sets the tone for what would become a, if not the, main focus of Deep Space Nine. As the galaxy-class USS Odyssey beats a hasty retreat, a Jem'Hadar ship rams and destroys it. As Sisko points out to O'Brien, they're showing showing us how far they're willing to go. We'd find out just how far when all-out war erupted between the Federation and the Dominion, one of the most destructive and bloody in Star Trek history, and the first time a war had been depicted on screen in the show in such a detailed and prolonged manner. Also, as a direct result, in the opening Season 3 two-parter, The Search, the Defiant was brought out of mothballs and Odo learned the unfortunate truth about his origins. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed any examples, then please do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell so you never miss a Trek Culture video again. Also, head over to Twitter and Instagram to follow us there. And I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Littlechild. I've been Ellie with Trek Culture. I hope you have a wonderful day and remember to boldly go where no one has gone before.